please join me in the prayers for illumination. Dear God, let us not only hear of you, but see you with our own eyes through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Doing the Old Testament scripture lesson from Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. <clears throat> Thus say the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make more mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, who trust in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall not stay green. The leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is preserved. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. New Testament scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. Hear now a word of the Lord for you today. And keep in mind Nancy's uh, the framing around one of those these kind of days that God has still with us. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Sinai, Tyre, and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to false prophets. A word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the lectionary passages are pretty full of negative language this morning. So as I mentioned before, I spent an entire semester studying the book of Jeremiah in Hebrew, and then another semester studying the Gospel of Luke in Greek. So I'm definitely aware of the language uh, that both writers use. There's a lot, a lot going on here. We've got the blessings and woes, or curses, found in Luke chapter 6, and then God, or Yahweh, cursing those who trust in mortals, 
or humans. We're told that we can't trust our hearts in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, and then the rich, the full, and those who are lacking may even first. But Luke provides us this audience-specific narrative, and the audience is poor and marginalized. We see this in Luke's use of blessed are you who are poor. Rousseau Gonzalez writes that we should, this really shouldn't surprise us because if we remember, the presence of the needy is applied amongst the people of God. But in order to understand this, we might want to turn to the passage that appears in Matthew and Mark, but not in Luke. It's these famous words that, for you will always have the poor with you. Exact translations from Matthew 26, 11 and Mark 14, 7. But to this day, these words can even be used to avoid paying much attention to those needs of the poor. But this, in these two passages, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 15, where they've got the year of Jubilee and all property is to be restored to the former owners, but the law is commanding that this regulation need not be used as an excuse not to help the needy in the interim. It says people await this year of Jubilee, they must be liberal in support of the needy, not the other way around. And then, which is why I think it gets so much more complicated, we also have the audience who are rich, full, and laughing. Blessed are you who are rich. People from so many different classes are, and backgrounds are coming together and listening to Jesus, who's coming down to the people and standing on ground level with them. So those who feel blessed and those who feel cursed are all together. So as I was imagining all the emotions that were happening during this time, some people with their finest robes, um, I, I saw this uh, recently on Facebook as the those albino alligator Hermes bags, which are $100,000, $200,000 and driving their Porsche. And then those who have barely anything, those who are poor, hungry, crying, numb, and angry. There's people from different nationalities, tribes, and families. You have people from Judea and Jerusalem, city and entirety. Some are jealous of the others. Some feel marginalized by the others. Some were even enslaved by the other, or had been the history of them. There were people that fished for a living, those who owned land, those who had no home, who were able to afford luxurious oils and salts, and others had to bathe in the river. You had people deemed clean and unclean. And all of these people were trying to touch Jesus, so they all got closer to one another in this crowd. One of the commentators, Dr. Heinrich of Luther Seminary, writes that the text is full of promises to those who are suffering in this world that God still sees them, loves them, and is intent on their thriving. Jesus' words are also a warning call to his hearers that they are able to live with attention and generosity towards their neighbors, even as God is attentive and generous. She also writes that the wealth gap the food deserts, the education gap, the health gap, many things that are on our minds and recognitions of failures across the globe mark these two sides of the blessings and the woes, the blessings and the curse. It's in this gap that we're called to address by this passage, for God's sake and our own. It's what the children of God do and what they repent of not having done, confident that God gives new opportunities to live with generosity and attention. But then there are times, which is a unique circumstance, that those who are struggling can't focus on some of these gaps within racial, socioeconomic, 
healthcare and more because they're so weighed down by their lives. For me, this came true as I would get angry with a world that said was moving in a way that seemed normal. And I just felt this combination of mental and physical exhaustion. So I really wanted to avoid the text in Luke 6, 25. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. I mean, thinking of how spiritually hungry I've been over the last month, and how we literally moved from a day of laughter to a day of grieving, gave me a lot of sobriety of thought during this time. And it seems fitting that Amy is the liturgist uh, for me today because she shared on Facebook within the first week of us handling things in Colorado that really stuck. It was a quote from Jenny Young that said, pause and remember, every situation in life is temporary. So when life is good, make sure you enjoy it fully. And when life is not so good, remember that it will not last forever, and better days are on the way. I just feel like this paired so well within the Gospel of Luke, where I see this hope in the preparation of Jesus' teachings in verse 19, where the power comes out of him and heals all of them. So how do we feel this healing power of Jesus? We find this through Jeremiah's reminder that we are to trust in the Lord, and we are called to be those whose trust is the Lord. The is is really critical, especially in the Hebrew translation. We can find this as trees planted by water, sending out our roots by the stream. In the years of drought, we are not anxious, and we continue to bear fruit, even during these seasons. But it's not easy for a tree during the seasons of drought or seasons of storm or whatever it may be. So there isn't this promise of avoiding pain, avoiding sorrow, or anything else. We see this repeatedly in the Gospels, the Old and New Testaments, and church life, history, and our present reality. The reason these trees are blessed is that they send out the roots by the stream. So in these times, we know exactly where to get our spiritual water when all other streams seem to run dry. In seasons of drought, the place to get water is underground. But for us, as trees planted, we know where to find this spiritual nourishment even closer to ground level. We must find our spiritual nourishment in our centers, where we are our truest selves, and we can connect to Christ the easiest. When we feel that we're at the margin of the world, the society, or even our specific situation, we know there is a day that we can leap for joy when we fully enter into God's heavenly space where suffering and pain shall be no more. And friends, this is the good news. Amen.